Okay, I have some more people to let in. <laughs> Okay, so um, thank you for coming. Really, uh, it's lovely to see so many people uh, that, uh, that arrived and that applied. Um, so unfortunately, I had to unmute you because the last time uh, I had to mute you because the last time not everybody were switching the microphone so we could hear all the background noise and, and just how somebody's cooking, singing and so on. So if you want to contact, just uh, write me on a, on a chat. I can see that on the, on the screen. I hope that you all can see me and uh, what is more important, the screen, and that you can hear me well. Okay, there's some more people entering. Let me just, yeah, all right. So if there is any kind of problems, if you cannot hear me, if you don't see well, just uh, let me know, text me, text, on a, text me by message. Uh, but I hope that we won't have any technical or any, any other problems. As uh, others are uh, joining, I will shortly make introduction for, uh, for this class and then we can uh, go to the, to the topic because uh, there is a lot of things I wanna tell you today. So um, okay, so let me introduce my colleagues and my myself. Uh, this um, just a second, more people. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Okay, so uh, we are uh, uh, we are a team of uh, Aita Bioarchaeology. Uh, we are dedicating to online courses and field schools. Uh, well, it's like they, there is um, several of, of us uh, and uh, and a dog, Radas. <laughs> And uh, all of us are um, uh, doctors or PhD can candidates from different fields of uh, bioarchaeology, archaeology, paleoradiology, microscopic analysis, um, dental anthropology, archaeozoology, um, uh, archaeobotany, and so on. So uh, by this, uh, we, we cover like a, a big amount of different topics in, um, in bioarchaeology. So this the courses that, that we are offer are also like dedicated to different topics that we consider to be like important and that are missing in uh, in common uh, like the that that is a, that needs some additional classes classes let's say. Um, my name is Natasha Sharkic. I'm a PhD of uh, bioarchaeology of physical. Uh, uh, anthropology, whatever you you prefer, and uh, but I'm also an archaeologist, so I have this two background uh, from the field and uh, from um, uh, from lab, and uh, that's why I I really think that this uh, this course and this lessons of mortuary archaeology is extremely important because it's combining two things. It's uh, combining this. Uh, knowledge of anatomy and uh, analysis, anthropological analysis, and also it's uh, combining the 
the other analyze the, the the other part of archaeological part. Apart from that, we also offer like this advanced course uh, in bioarchaeology, bioarchaeology of children, which is something that is really important, I think, for uh, for like the, this big uh, in big picture uh, of of uh, knowledge because it's uh, children bones are quite small and fragile and unfortunately until very recently there were not uh, there were not a lot of studies about um, children bones and there is also dental anthropology this is another important course because it's like the, this weak point for most of of students and uh, or researchers because the two are like the different story completely of bones and uh, I really think that they require special training. And the new course that we also offer now, it's a course uh, introduction to archaeozoology, which is another very uh, interesting and fascinating topic in, uh, inside of, of a field of archaeology. So uh, this, as you know, it's a free, free class, a free lecture, but in the same time, it's an introduction to a mortuary archaeology, uh, to mortuary archaeology course. So today we were going to talk about the, the beginning of uh, funeral practice and the beginning of this discipline as well. I will see like the different topics inside of, um, of, this, uh, of this class. But in the future, in the next days, uh, we will also talk about some important, uh, important issues inside of, of more what can enter inside of the field of mortuary archaeology, such as ethics. Uh, this is the, one of the most important topic, of course, in here, because we are working with the human remains, and this is so uh, delicate, and in the same time, can be can provoke a lot of discussion. So it's not it's unlike the other archaeological material. It's, uh, we have to be extra careful with that. So that's why we dedicated one entire class to that. We will talk about uh, the role uh, of anthropologists in archaeological excavation. So how, why it's important to have an anthropologist on excavation and what kind of additional information we can bring to, to, the, to the excavation in general. We will talk about that a little bit today as well in this class, but more on that in uh, uh, Friday, no, no, Saturday. <laughs> um, we'll uh, talk in more details about other funeral practice other than uh, what we're going to mention today. Location of necropolis, limitation of excavation area, basically how to start excavation uh, with human remains, excavation with burials. Uh, we dedicated also one entire class to cremation because as a process, it's quite different than uh, inhumation, and of course, the remains that are that are preserved after cremations are way more different. So that's why it's again necessary a uh, special training to that. Of course, we are going to talk a lot about the phonomic processes because uh, we will mention it today as well because their influence and uh, influence of of this. Uh, both human and non-human uh, elements is actually essential to correct interpretation of a, of a burial and what are we actually looking when we are looking at uh, remains and uh, of course how to properly excavate uh, human remains. On this introduction class we will start with uh, the, the as it as it should be the, the the evolution of archaeology of death or mortuary archaeology or uh, archaeothanatology as you prefer. So, what is the definition? What is the pro purpose of it? And which methods uh, do we apply when we are analyzing the this um, when we're working on the field? Uh, we will talk about uh, how humans came to this weird idea of uh, making ritual burials of their uh, beloved ones. What is a, a funeral practice? Uh, what type of funeral practice exists according to cultures and chronology? Of course, we cannot mention all the cultures and all burial practice, so we are going to be more focused on Europe. Also, we will talk about, after talking about correct way to, to like in, in some culture, we have to also mention these deviant burials and burials that are like quite unusual. 
And, and uh, for the last, uh, we will talk uh, about the um, status, rank, uh, power, sex, and all these things that can be seen inside of, of how we can read the, the, all these identities of one person inside of uh, one funeral and one inside of one grave or a group of graves. So let's begin with the with the class after this intro. So uh, the the name of the course is and in this intro class is mortuary archaeology, but we can also find the different synonyms or uh, close um, definitions. It can be also called uh, archaeotanatology, funerary archaeology, and uh, archaeology of death. All of them, all of these names. So sometimes maybe I would use one or the other. So just don't get confused. It's all the same. It's a discipline that is situated within archaeology, and uh, it has base in a study of uh, different society. The main basic idea of this is to study different society from the past through their burial uh, culture, the, their burial rites, their skeletal remains, and uh, all this uh, surrounding like architecture and all everything that is inside of this of this burial, and so this um, it's based on a knowledge of natural decay processes, which is like the toponomic process that we already mentioned. So uh, and making reconstructing those processes and uh, making difference differentiation yet this between it and uh, human activities. So the idea is to reconstruct how historically people uh, dealt, dealt with their death. So with the fact first that somebody passed away and then like what to do with the, with the body. So this, um, when archeologists are excavating the, the ancient uh, graves, they would uh, typically encounter either like skeletal remains uh, or burned bones on most of the cases. So these are these are results are uh, ser these are results of series of dynamic processes of the decay. So like what is naturally happening to to a body, but there is also it can be like a putrefaction decomposition uh, until ideally the skeletalization or fossilization. But this and there is also a lot depending a lot uh, how this process will go. It's depending a lot of the treatments after death. So this is what we are coming to mortuary practices or to mortuary right. So this term uh, is refers to, to all practices that are connected to death and burial within one culture. And they're understood as important customs that gives a form to values uh, and concerns, belief systems and identities. So as we said, like in order to reconstruct the cultural central practice, we need to visualize them and separate them from the results of natural processes. So of course, the after from the moment when a person died, they're starting a lot of natural processes. And but uh, the way that we interact and how we intervene in this process have can lead it to different paths. So the, like most uh, easier to remember would be mummification. So we are just intervening, like we when we say we are, I mean humans, when we are stopping the process of of decomposition or decaying at the very beginning. So of course in this case in this way that the body will not go all the way to, to putrefaction, at least if we do it right, it's, we won't get the skeletal remains, but we will get the soft tissue that is, that is dry at the moment. So, and to start uh, with this de development of, uh, of archaeology of death or uh, mortuary archaeology, we have to see how uh, archaeology was developing. Of course, I'm not going to say the whole history of of archaeology, but just, just like for you to get some idea of its uh, development. So this the first and more still more one of the most exciting sites and discoveries in the history of archaeology was Pompeii, discovery of Pompeii. So in the 18th century, uh, with the with the King Carlos of, of Spain, who was also the king of Napoli, uh, that's 
they started the, the excavation that is still going on, basically. And uh, this uh, began with this array of ancient Pompeii. And although they still didn't uh, define the city uh, as it is uh, until much later in uh, uh, 1763. So you know the story of Pompeii, I don't need to explain so, but you also, if you haven't been there, at least you have seen the, the images from there. It's definitely one of those most exciting things you can, you can find in archeology. span So the whole city like completely preserved under the ash. So this was something that was really amazing and that awoke uh, a lot of, lot of interest because it was literally the city frozen in the time and not only the city, because there were also under the layers of ash, there were of course people that were uh, like, were basically like frozen in a moment of trying to escape from lavas and from ash. And so this during the excavation already now in, a, in the 19th century, uh, Giuseppe Fiorelli came to this idea of pouring liquid uh, gypsum, uh, gypsum inside of those cavities. So uh, because the, the ones when, the, when, it, when it got cold, the, the lash and lava uh, left the places where the, like the, the body that was body was occupying. But of course, during this process of decay, this place was now smaller because now there is, a, there is just like the empty space around it. And of course, uh, remains of human, but the space that body was uh, occupying, now it's like that it, we have negative basically of what was once uh, human. So by inserting, like pouring this liquid uh, gypsum, they got basically like the mold like what, what we are using in, to make a sculpture. And so they could have this amazing molds of people and animals in a moment of, of their very last moment of before death. So their movements, even facial expression, clothes, food. And uh, we have this amazing thing such as uh, this uh, like dog or, or um, literally like we could have the, this the entire like so many uh, sculptures and of people in a in a moment of trying to escape, trying to hug a uh, beloved one for the last time, and so on. So, of course, this awoke enormous interest in archaeology, which led to hundreds and thousands of new exciting uh, discoveries. That um, so it's a um, this success of archaeology, but also this important, incredible interest for archaeology of about well, what, what else we can find. So it started with this uh, amazing discoveries all over the world. But still, there was something missing. So no matter how much uh, graves that were all like open, and no matter, no matter how much amazing, like the pyramid, whether it's pyramids or like this um, uh, Bronze Age uh, tombs or whatever, there were archaeologists there were still uh, focused on what they're going to find inside of the grave and not uh, to body itself. So this, um, in the beginning, the excavations, they were belonging mostly to archaeologists who were, who were focused on jewelry, architecture, grave goods, uh, weapons, whatever was inside of the grave and around the grave, the architecture of the grave and so on. And they were um, not paying a lot of attention to the body itself. So there was this great uh, contradiction because they were studying human past without studying human remains. So and, um, although anthropology started, was developing uh, like separately, uh, so anthropologist, even when it, uh, he or she was consulted, uh, there it was basically to do just laboratory analysis. So the bones would be brought to, to him or her without enough of uh, in additional information from the site. So there were, would be missing um, many things such as uh, there normally there would be just some little schematic um, representation or or not even that a grave uh, number of the grave and that's it. So 
And what was archaeologist in most of the cases, anthropologist was asked in most of the cases would be just to give information about demography, such as sex and age, because in most of the cases, what archaeologists wanted to know is just this basic uh, identity of that person, so they could uh, connect this kind of fibula to females or this kind of um, or this kind of uh, weapon to uh, males of that certain age and so on. So um, in many cases, it would be just very, very separate archaeology and anthropology. They still didn't um, met. And, uh, but they, this is kind of um, absurd because uh, this, the, the individual that was buried in the grave is the main element and the main reason why everything uh, else that we can find there. So um, that's why this idea of uh, funeral archaeology was born a little bit later, because it is essential that uh, anthropological study begins in the field and end in laboratory. So this, um, the one of the, the first who would uh, revolutionize the, the, the mortuary archaeology and uh, connect the, the things that were found in um, inside of the grave with individual, although still not connecting the anthropological analyze, uh, would be Beamford. And uh, this his um, Beamford and Sachs hypothesis in uh, in seventies um, brought to to light this idea that what is found in a in a grave and what kind of practice mortuary practice. Uh, was conducted would also be uh, deeply in, uh, interrelated with the social social cultural uh, system, and also could give us the uh, information about that individual and uh, his or her identity. So, through going through many ethnographic data, uh, they came to conclusion. Binford came to to conclusion that. Uh, individual social identity was symbolically represented in their burial. So we will see more examples of, of that. But uh, the idea was that although this seems quite logical to us nowadays, but we have to take into account that these are uh, like 50 years ago, and that was quite revolutionary. And so this, the idea was that because they were mostly focused on prehistoric uh, societies, so without having a lot of oh, the society that we don't know a lot about, we don't know about their uh, belief system, or we don't know a lot about their, we don't have historical records. Uh, so this kind of symbolical uh, representations of uh, in that we can see in a burial is actually can actually represent their their uh, um, symbolical their belief system and uh, also that can represent the position of that individual so this uh, he argued that the heterogeneity in mortuary practice so if all the individuals would have the same kind of of practice is characterized for a single social cultural unit that is characteristic for a single social uh, cultural unit uh, until um, would vary directly with the complexity of status of uh, hierarchy as well as overall organization of the society. So the more complex the burial is and the more differences between two burials inside of the same community or in the same uh, society would mean that the, the society is more uh, separated or more structured. Uh, so this uh, anthropologists have long uh, recognized since a long time that the value of funeral practice for the study of religious beliefs, social organization and status differentiation. The way that people treat deceased member of the community is dispose uh, his or her body and uh, perceive their relationship with the dad as a central social practice. So to make it simple, uh, and that uh, depending of what we find inside of the grave and uh, how is we, what we find around it, 
uh, can determine the social structure of the society and also like by start through studying the artifacts and burials that can be found inside. So differential treatment of the body, uh, varying the facility of disposal, these different grave goods, all this can mean that this individual had different social persona so that in a way would be somebody who is like the of higher society, uh, higher social status? For example, well, this would be like the most simple example. But we have this uh, burial in Varna. Okay, obviously this was not a commoner. This person uh, was in a way somebody of the higher status, and it's represented through all this luxury uh, things that can be found in a, in this grave. So the and then if we have in the same society, the very simple empty graves or with something that is very not important, this is obviously showing that this society was a very, um, very um, separate in, a, in, a, in this, uh, this uh, ranking. Of course, this theory was later criticized uh, to be oversimplified and we will see also why. But we are, for the moment, we still uh, we're going to see like the, the, the um, how this uh, archaeology of death was um, uh, evolving, and after that we will see like all these theories and why they are not that as perfect. So uh, the the real uh, uh, archaeology of death, uh, and also the name of the book is uh, is that it's uh, it starts with Dude and uh, the French uh, archaeologist, and uh, he's. He was he's considered the father of archaeology of death. And he made this change from this, just looking at the object and trying to identify to, to determine the story of that person through the object by putting the body as a central element. So the spotlight on the body or what is a remain of this uh, of this individual and insisting and studying the, the individual on the field and including all this multidisciplinarity of archaeology, anthropology, and all this archaeozoology, everything into, into the same um, into the same style, into the same analysis, let's say, including everything. So for both the anthropologists and archaeologists, it is essential uh, that the study of burials begin in the field. So, so to, the, to a great extent, the care with which the bones are excavated and the data recorded determines the potentiality, potentiality of the, and validity of the later, uh, later study. So it's really essential to have anthropologists on the field because um, the person who, who knows a lot about anatomy, uh, who knows a lot about human skeletal, will get the most of information from this, from the field, because every anthropological excavation is destructive process. So the everything that is not documented in the field, everything that is not seen during the excavation, everything that was not noticed will disappear forever. So it is really important to make the most uh, detailed uh, excavation and of course to have somebody there who is really into the bones, into anatomy, into taphonomy, so we can get the most of this analysis, we can get the most information from, uh, from the burial itself. So the, according to him, the, so the, the field anthropologist must ensure that each piece of or, or fragment of the skeleton is accurately identified in situ, which uh, on the field, in its exact position, anatomical orientation, and relationship to other elements of the tomb or other individuals, depending on the tomb, of course. Where is there some burial goods or more generally the whole funeral system? So that's why it's uh, the base of an uh, archaeology of death would be that uh, multidisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity of the study on the on the necropolis. Understanding the human skeletal remains are material of high archaeological value. And uh, unfortunately, until quite recently, they were not considered that, like that. So we had a lot of 
situation where uh, bones would be excavated and just ended up in some museum, depot of uh, museum and um, never analyzed, or they were even reburied and in this way lost for science without any studying previously. And also this uh, prefounding the, the knowledge of the society of the past goes through the, this executive knowledge of the uh, and the perceived bones remains, their pathologies, their care and the treatment given to their dead. So that's why it's really important to include everything into the study. So this, uh, the funerary archaeology also aims to use all the information from the necropolis uh, for the analysis of the ritual. And also like the, all this uh, subsequent extrapolation of social structure of Asian society. And uh, by using the, the anatomy, taphonomy, forensic science, and uh, all these different knowledges, in combination, of course, with archaeological observation in the field, and uh, taking also into account cultural factors, factors uh, such as mortuary practice and separating it from natural factors, uh, we can make this reconstruction of the most complete reconstruction of one burial, uh, um, one burial process. And uh, in, in reconstructing detail how people in the past handled their death. The concept of the taphonomy that we are going to talk a lot uh, later and uh, next classes, it's a uh, it's name in taphonomy in Greece means literally laws of burial. Uh, it is the um, science or yeah, like let's say the, the or the uh, help helping like the sub uh, sub uh, sub no, I cannot say sub science but science let's say, and uh, that is. Um, that is describing and focusing on the post-mortem processes that occur from the moment of death to fossilization in ideal situation. Of course, not all uh, that will be fossilized. In some cases, of course, this process can be disturbed in many ways. And it is now generally accepted that the phonomy studies are like studies all post-mortal processes, not only the, the, the one that are on based on, on fossils. So the approach make it possible to reconstruct in details how people in the past handled their death. And also like if they were buried, for example, in a coffin or it was in a, just in a pit without coffin, if they were buried with clothes, if there was a, if they were decomposed somewhere else, prior to this final deposition. So if it was a primary or secondary burial, if there were, if the graves were later open and to, to put more individuals, if there is several individuals, we can actually say if they're they die and were buried and were buried simultaneously, or if there were sometimes spam, so we can say that there were several individuals buried in different moments. So all this information we can get if we observe uh, carefully and uh, with using all these mentioned methodologies. So next, uh, uh, this subtopic, let's say, it, uh, uh, how the the emergence of uh, emergence of human burials and how we started and why we started to to bury our our dead and. Um, we're, we're not the, definitely the only uh, species that uh, can feel a grief or a love or empathy or, or to be like depressed after somebody's death. Uh, we know that uh, there's also many other animal species that uh, they're, they're feeling the same or it. So um, there is a, a whole set of criterias that are they can, that are showing clearly that the, the that an animal and a lot of evidence that an animal can be very depressed uh, to the point that they will completely change their habits even against their own instinct in order to like after somebody's uh, death. So according to Barbara King, uh, if surviving animals who had close relationship to the nearly deceased becomes a socially withdrawn 
it's a failing to eat and sleep uh, or travel in a routine ways and it's showing species specific evidence of emotions then we can uh, see widespread evidence of an emotional response to death in animals so we have uh, the scientists have uh, documented many cases of death response especially in primates but also in a mom, uh, in um, uh, mammals uh, mostly but it can be also that for us is more easy to recognize emotions in mammals because many of them are representing emotions in a similar way so we've noticed in um, as we said in many primates in seals and um, dogs horses elephants dolphins but even in birds we know that um, in many cases the birds would simply stop looking for another partner or even stop eating after losing their uh, their partner. And then many species also of the, of the birds are mating once in life and with one partner and they stay uh, fidel even if, the, if that another dies. Uh, elephant seems also to have very, very um, uh, developed consciousness of death. And not only that they are, go, they are going through grief and this um, mourning processes, but they're also, there were once observed of, of with us that they were stopping and touching the skull of prominent female who died several months before. So this is really similar to some sort of um, worshiping or like showing respect uh, to individual that pass away. So it's not only that uh, they feel that they're sad after um, their, some of their tribe pass away, but they also can connect the remains that are, of course, not even looking anymore as an elephant. They don't have elephant shape anymore. They are just bones, but they know that these bones are still that individual. So the same respect that they had in the past for that uh, female, they were showing to, their, to her remains. So which is, very fascinating. And uh, we know also for ch chimpanzees that uh, they would stop eating, uh, they would observe the corpse in si silence. And especially if it's happened to, to, to youngsters, uh, the mother can carry the dead infants for days or week. Uh, there was even recently a case of a small chimpanzee that fall from the tree and die. So the mother, like after trying to, uh, to put him back to life when they realized that, yeah, he, that he is dead, uh, the mother took some grass and washed his teeth. So there's still some kind of, of uh, special, <laughs> um, special treatments that they show when uh, when a person die and definitely they are aware of 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 death and they understand the death this death is something that is that is uh, like this uh, point of no return we also know that in uh, 72 1972 james godal uh, witnessed that a young male chimp uh, after his mother died he completely stopped eating and socializing to the, the point that he didn't survive. He was, not, um, he was not anymore a baby, he could feed himself. So it was uh, not this um, connection of dependency that starved him, but simply as Jane said, he was heartbroken. And uh, there's also this uh, image uh, under that it's uh, coming from my country, from Serbia, there was a case of of a dog that uh, was sleeping during uh, months on uh, she dig a hole and uh, she was sleeping in her grave of uh, her I don't like the word owner but uh, of her human and she even uh, gave a birth uh, of her puppies there and eventually they had needed to take uh, the puppies from her to to be able to feed them and uh, so so they could survive because mother was refusing to uh, leave this uh, hole in a tomb in a, in a grave uh, not even for seeking the food for uh, for herself and for for babies to, to produce milk 
So all these behaviors are very interesting, and especially when it comes to dogs or cats, because it's not only inside, it's interspecies uh, relationship. So it's not only that they can feel um, enormous grief for their own species, but also for another one that they're, uh, that they're co-living with, that they're sharing life. But uh, all this is, um, all these examples are very strong and uh, very impacting because it's uh, it means that this uh, sadness, that this depression, that this grief that animals are feeling uh, upon losing the, the close relatives or uh, children or mother uh, is even stronger than instinct. And this is something that is changing a, a lot our perspective because in the past scientists uh, would claim that animals are just um, move by their instincts. But here we see that uh, some examples that emotions would uh, be so strong that they would even affect the instinct of like searching for food or feeding your own um, babies or trying just surviving and uh, continuing with life. But uh, moving bodies is not something that is typical from uh, primate behavior. So maybe because primates and other uh, uh, mammals, they're usually not trying to bury a body, not even to, to move a body. Perhaps because they're not, um, they're not staying long in one place um, because probably humans or uh, other like the ancestors, at some point, uh, whether it's for emotion, whether for practical reason, if they would settle in one place or visiting often one place, they would probably need to do something with the body. So it's not only we're definitely sharing the awareness of death and feelings of grief uh, with many other animals. So we are not alone in these feelings. Uh, with these feelings, we are not the only one uh, that have a like, strong emotional reaction on death. But for what, far as we know, we are the only one who, who are burying uh, our death. So how one of the most important questions in archaeology is when and why we develop these mortuary rites. So this question is uh, one of very problematic in, uh, uh, in archaeology. Because, uh, <coughs> sorry, we have a lot of problematic examples or examples that might be or might be not the, 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 actually the first burial practice. So um, there is a lot of polemics about that. And I will just represent a few cases without trying to say yes or no. Uh, so one of these um, recent discoveries Belonging to, it was found in uh, South Africa, is uh, um, this cave system called Rising Star, uh, where this the remains of 15 different individuals of the species called Homo naledi. Uh, they were discovered in very, very deep part of the, the caves. Uh, they are dated uh, between 250 and 300,000 years before Christ or before modern era. And there is no signs of carnivorous activities. And it's quite unlikely that other animals carried uh, those bones in the cave. And also there is no indication that some large uh, scale movement of water wall could depose the bones there either. So it's probably or most likely that, um, that there's uh, uh, those uh, people, not people, but uh, Homo naledi, that were occupying that, that cave were also the one who would put uh, the, the remains of their dead, uh, deceased one, to, to that very, very uh, far away channel of the chamber of this cave. So as you can see in this illustration, uh, the remains were found very, very far away. And there is a couple of very, an extremely narrow passage where you can basically crawl. And of course there is no sunlight there at all. So uh, it means that there was 
they were, were uh, trouble a lot. They had to put a lot of effort to come to that, that part. Of course, so you can see that it's also not possible that water could pass through all this because it's um, going up and down. So it's, it's, it would be quite strange that water brought it there. Uh, but uh, so there's, um, yeah, there, there, um, sorry, I forgot the most important part that uh, of some of scientists, of course, the one that found those, uh, the rising star cave, uh, they believe that uh, this is, this is representing some symbolic purposes because they put a lot of effort in removing the bones all the way to, to here. So this is not, according to them, just some practical reasons. There must be something, some symbolic reasons in it. However, not everybody would agree with that because um, uh, even among humans, there we have like so many different funeral behaviors and uh, some of them, no matter how they're uh, variety and complex, but we have, all in something in the common that <coughs> that we will remove the the corpse from the place where we live so it's not a, uh, maybe it's not that strange that even small brained hominin would uh, decide to to put the the these uh, bodies that uh, that are smelling bad that are attracting insect and carnivores and all that very, very far away from the where they're normally uh, spending time uh, because of uh, of all these dangers that can be brought and a bad smell and all that. So uh, according to some, this is not really symbolic, but rather practical reasons behind that. Another complicated uh, uh, example is uh, Cima de los Huesos or Pit, um, uh, pit hole in uh, Atapuerca in Spain. And you probably know about, or you heard about Atapuerca. It's an extremely important site in, uh, in Spain. And uh, there we have quite complex and a uh, uh, hard to understand situation. Where again, in a very, very uh, distant chamber and distant part of the, uh, the cave, and uh, in a part that is quite hard to, to access, uh, there were found like a lot of remains of Neanderthals, Denisova and modern uh, man, together with plenty of animal bones. Why here Neanderthal has this um, red asterisk is because it's still a lot of, in the beginning of this, uh, in the past this, uh, these uh, remains were attributed to Homo heidelbergensis, <laughs> but uh, after DNA analysis, uh, they discovered that actually this uh, might be the their Denisova, their modern man, and or proto Neanderthals, or some kind of local uh, variation on, to Neanderthals. So. We have here a situation that we have uh, like the, this black representing human fossils and above that we have plenty of animal bones. And of animal bones, most of it are carnivores. So what happened here? Uh, relatively few of animal and human bones were articulated and some bones had the tooth mark uh, from car carnivores that were chewing them. So obviously for some amount of time, those bones were exposed and obviously they were, they attracted those, they those carnivores. So one of the interpretation is that uh, animals and humans would fall into the pit uh, from a high chamber and then they were they would be trapped there and unable to to get out. So maybe they were just attracted. Maybe there were some human remains that of uh, humans that fell inside, and then animals attracted with that smell would also end up there. So the stratigraphy suggests that humans were deposed in a cave before bears and other carnivals. The other possibility is that uh, large, because it's uh, we, the given the large amount of mud that was found in uh, this pit, that bones and human, uh, uh, the human bones and um, animal bones were just uh, 
came from another place by uh, through some series of mud flows. So th that were just pushed by, by water as this place is more uh, below. And the third hypothesis um, is that this uh, accumulation of human remains might be a result of a mortuary practice. So that uh, they were for or this deposed or thrown there. So that's, if they were uh, thrown there, was there something, was it really a burial? Or it was again, just practical reason like, wow, this guy starts smelling bad. We have to do something about that. So in order to estimate something or determine something as a, as a burial, or to, to say that there is a, uh, actually this uh, funeral practice, we need to prove that there is some kind of intentionality behind this. So that is not just removing the body for purely practical reasons, but there's, there is some other reason behind that. So it's not just removing uh, because of bad smell, because of animals, insects, and um, so on. But instead of that, there is uh, actually the need to have burial practice. Um, because in that way, this means that um, this is the, the, the um, this would be the proof of some complex symbolic and abstract thinking. Uh, that means that the compassion and care for death and need to to do to give them some kind of um, so to show them some to show some sort of respect connections feeling of of loss so to have some kind of special treatment for them. So Neanderthals, uh, who as we know were. Uh, coexisting with homo, homo sapiens for hundreds of thousands of years, almost certainly buried their dead. And uh, we have a lot, uh, lot of possible um, proofs all around Europe and uh, Middle East. And one of them is in a Tabun cave in Israel that is about 100,000 years ago. And uh, here we have the case of Neanderthal woman who was placed partially on her left side and um, that the grave was excavated near the edge of the cave. So this special position and this necessity to excavate the, the grave may be some of the first signs of sort of uh, burial practice because it's not just removing the dead body but intention of giving some practice by special positions, by excavating the, the grave. Similar in, a, oh, even better, <laughs> in Shanidra cave in Northern Iraq, where there was about 10 uh, Neanderthal men, women and children that were found. One of uh, first individual that was discovered in the um, 70s, I think, was uh, named Shanidra Z. Uh, who lived uh, about 70,000 uh, uh, 70, 70, yes, <laughs> years ago. And uh, the, when the first, when they were making the excavation there, the uh, archaeologists found uh, in sediments some containing of ancient pollens that was mineralized in, uh, in remains, uh, suggesting that it might have been, uh, that this individual might be buried with flowers. So this uh, hypothesis helped to change the, um, uh, this prevailing popular uh, view at the Neanderthals of that time, that they were like the uh, brutish, they were like um, kind of um, savage, let's say, and they're less intelligent and so on. So uh, there was, um, sorry, thank you. Um, there was, a, after that, this, um, of course, there was a lot of, uh, uh, there was a lot of, um, there, there was a lot of disagreement to that. There was like, oh, come on, this uh, pollen might be just a modern contamination. Maybe it was brought with rodents and uh, many critics of this flower burial. But uh, recent excavation that were continued in this, uh, in this cave, uh, like the modern ones show without any 
problems because now we have like well, first we are much more careful what we're excavating but also we have much more of modern technology so it's shown that uh, definitely there were um, pollen in in this um, in the sediment so which is showing that definitely Neanderthals were using flowers uh, at least in this one case for a burial. So uh, this uh, and also those individuals were not all buried in the same moment. So uh, we know that there was a there might be some time between death, maybe weeks, maybe uh, decades, maybe centuries. It's really hard to tell when we when we're looking at the remains that are that old. But the point is that they didn't die in the same moment. So Neanderthals were returning to the same point, and they would again and again use uh, this cave to depose their death. So this is already some sign of ritual, which is showing the cultural complexity of a high order. So they had a special place to bury their death, and they have special rituals to to like the to worship them. So there's also um, uh, those, uh, uh, oh, it's really hard for me to pronounce, but uh, sorry if somebody is <laughs> from this, um, if, if my pronunciation is, is terrible, but uh, Eskul and Kafsek caves, sorry, for sure not like that. <laughs> they were um, dated from 80,000 to, uh, uh, to 120,000 years uh, uh, before modern era, and they contain remains of 15 hominids. Eight of them were children. And uh, this is definitely, and for sure, no doubts, a uh, real funeral uh, practice, um, because they were they found with a with deceased uh, individual, they were found in Mediterranean uh, sea um, shells that were brought from like 30, 35 kilometers away. So it cannot be there just like part of sediments. No, they were intentionally brought from that far distance to be buried with an individuals. Uh, there were probably some sort of necklace, a necklace that they were wearing it. Uh, we could find that this in cultural layers that this funeral practice was of inhabitants was uh, persisted through a long span of time. So the same place was used uh, over and over to, to do both that. Um, thank you. Um, so, and one of this individual, individual number 11, uh, was adolescent, age of about 13 years. And here we can see quite complex, actually, the, the behavior, mortuary behavior, because uh, there was the, the pit was dug in a bedrock. Uh, the individual was uh, lying on its back. The legs were bent on the side. The hand was placed on the either side of the neck. And there were even antlers of large red deer. And there, were, uh, there was a use of ochre as well. And not only this, but in also in some other Burials. So this is already quite complex, um, quite complex burial behavior, and we will see that these things, such as shells um, on uh, antlers and ochre, were used for a very very long period of time. And obviously, this is not only decoration; it has symbolics in it, and uh, we will discuss possible reasons for that, but definitely this, from that moment, we have uh, established some sort of, uh, of a mortuary practice that will be repeated over like the, the uh, thousands uh, of centuries, like thousands of years and centuries and centuries for a very long period of time. So Paul Petit in 2018 defined four steps in a process that leads for formation of, a, of leads to the formation of funerary custom. So the first one is a chemical detection of death. So it's our ability to smell these characteristic gases that the cadaver is uh, uh, emitted, and. Um, for us, this is something that is very repulsive, that we are 
totally non-attracted to that. But in the same time, it's very attractive to, <laughs> to some animals, uh, some sort of carnivores, and uh, of course for insects. And uh, for um, so this uh, this first step that is uh, that we realizing that this uh, disorder, this smell, is something unpleasant for us, and at the same time, it's attracting a lot of animals that maybe wouldn't come close. This would be the first step to understanding that okay, we have to do something with this. We cannot just leave the body here. But this is clearly practical, like, or we are going to move from the body or we have to move a body from us. Some of these things have to happen. Uh, next step is like this uh, emotions of grief, loss, mourning, depression, uh, that we are also sharing with some other animals, um, but it's still no need to do something about that. We just, we can just feel, but no need for making something with it. No need to, articulate these feelings, no need still to give them some sort of, of a social construct around it. And uh, the process of the third step is the process of rationalization that includes attempts to understand the cause of death, like why this individual died, and also this, um, this uh, trying to, to connect it with this emotional social disruption in this case and ultimately anticipate and explain it, like why people or why other animals are dying. And of course, this is very philosophical uh, question that is that all religions and um, cults and um, belief systems are around that trying to explain like, why are we dying and what is happening after we die. And the fourth step is actually cultural elaboration. So that is bringing to mortuary behavior. So the step where we switch from animal-like mourning, like a grief, and uh, we begin to develop some rituals. Or we can also say that uh, elaborating this, making the like, cultural event of it is going from something that is very personal like that, uh, what we feel and think when, uh, when someone dies to next step that is uh, that in, would involve religious beliefs and rituals, but is also involving the rest of our community. So it's not only that uh, that's, we are saying uh, with our own grief and with our own feelings, but there is also a community that has some sort of some rules and um, that we follow in order to to like this, make this transition from uh, that to from life to death in the best possible way. So after we explain how uh, how humans and um, came to this uh, this idea, how they evolved this uh, evolution or archaeotentology, as uh, Petit say, the next we want to talk about is like what is uh, funeral practice and uh, to see some examples of it and uh, continuing with this evolution. So, uh, so why it's um, so important after, the, after all that, that, we, uh, that we study this? Because uh, when we have religion, not necessarily religion in, a, in the terms that we have today, like monotheistic or whatever, but when we have any kind of religion system, that can be also totemism or whatever. We have uh, belief, uh, according to Dirham, that we have beliefs and we have rituals. So beliefs are our thoughts, needs, uh, or opinions, and we are sharing with a certain group uh, that we belong to. But then we have rituals uh, that we are doing in a community that is providing the proper rules of action for certain uh, situations. And for, uh, for us, for archaeologists, uh, this knowledge of funeral practice is extremely important because it's giving us the, the idea of belief system of past popul population. Because if we are looking at the other aspects of uh, archaeological sites, or uh, I don't know, the house or uh, roads or some uh, object that we use every day, we are getting the idea of their 
practical life as okay they had this kind of pottery or they were building houses in that way they were using or not animals but um, through uh, through this uh, funeral practice and rituals that are involved we can actually have idea of religion a religion of these people or religious ideas or anyway we can see how they were thinking of death and uh, what kind of response they they had to to this uh, tra tragical tragical moment and tragical occurrence so this um after the the death those who who have some kind of common bonds such as religion or ethnic origin so the person that are belonging to same group they will perform a ritual to recognize the death and to honor honor this uh, disease uh, deceased uh, individual and the family. So this rit ritual is actually legitimization of the grief. So this uh, they provide an area uh, where the death is as, as acknowledged and they are finally accepted. They create a safe space for mourners to express emotion. They give you the rules how to express emotions for how long, and. Uh, what is important, uh, most important, is they are connecting with other families and friends, and actually you're getting all this emotional and practical support that you need through from your community through those rituals. So for sure, we can think of many of those rituals in our our culture as well, but also in a in a culture in the past. So these ritual practices after the death are of our loved ones, uh, and they're including the dealing with uh, remains, like this practical part, but also like this funeral, burials, gatherings, celebrations, and that they differ, as we know, like from across the cultures, uh, religions, uh, ethnicities, and social economic groups, and also that through the time periods. But uh, as we said, it's uh, in archaeological terms, this is the key for understanding beliefs of uh, a community. So, in the words of uh, Professor Tancha, uh, it says that a corpse occupies space and it's becoming corrupted, it starts to, to decay. It smells bad and it's contaminating the environment. So, that's why all the, the human groups has a response to a new situation through two strategies, like, or we are going to avoid this putrefication, or we are going to make it disappear. So most common response to death would be like inhumation. So it's where like the bodies like the, or uh, inhumation, the body is disappearing. We just cover it with rocks or we cover it with the soil or uh, it's cremations and we are going to like this just uh, again make the body disappear quickly or if this if the climate is good we can just stop this putrefication through mummification and uh, instead of having this bad smell and this uh, long process of decaying we will just make the body very quickly very dry or we can also do mummification uh, with ice and like that this uh, processes stopped, so no more problems. And um, the practice is from a social sense of the term, it's a way of proceeding, like a habitual uh, behavior or in one or another circumstances. So it's important in order to say that there is a certain funeral practice in one group, it's important to have this repetitive act. So we'll see uh, very soon the examples, but it has to be inside of one community, the same position of that, the same kind of, um, the same kind of uh, burial goods, uh, the architecture of the tomb, and uh, the way that we that uh, certain population is doing something. And we have to make the differentiation between this and funerary act. Funerary act can be just like a random burial of somebody. For example, uh, we can find a body in the wood and of, uh, and we decide just to bury it. And or there is a battle and or there is a soldier and uh, we just bury the body uh, in the in a, in a forest. But this is not funeral practice. This is not something that is typical for our uh, populations and it's not something that is uh, repeating 
normally inside of our group. So we have here like this example of uh, practice. We have here this habitual behavior. So we have here this like all the individual inside of one population, medieval church, and same position. All of them has the extended legs. All of them has the the uh, the hands on the chest or abdominal area, and uh, it's, everything is the same. So this would be like the example of of practice because it's repeating all the time and inside of this of the same religion in this case or in the same population. So uh, we are going to go through some uh, burial ritual rites in uh, in Europe through history quickly, of course, because it's uh, it's impossible to talk about all of them. And, uh, and of course, we cannot talk about all the continents and all the cultures. But just for you to get a little bit of idea, we were going, of course, to expand this and to talk more in details in uh, future classes. So we already mentioned a little bit of Paleolithic um, period and uh, this uh, emerge of the first burials, but in general, as it's of course very, very old, we don't have that much um, remains of, uh, of individuals from this period, uh, quite uh, scattered remains. But what is interesting is that the, the most of um, preserved ones are highly elaborated. Uh, so I'm not going to talk, uh, to give many examples. Uh, we will talk more about that in uh, some other classes. But sometimes there is like there is, was so much preparation for that death, and uh, so many like the special beads were made, and special knuckles, and uh, tooth of these animals, and, um, and like and again we can see this uh, similar symbols such as shells, uh, ochre, antlers, and so on. Through Mesolithic and Neolithic period, similar things uh, continue, uh, use of ochre, uh, the use of, um, use of similar symbols. But what is more common, especially for Neolithic period, is this fatal position. So like the individual would be uh, very flexed on a one or side and uh, the legs and arms, which um, might all again have a symbolic meaning, like it looks like the person is sleeping or it looks like it's uh, going to back to fatal position. And uh, here also in uh, this uh, period, Mesolithic and Analytic period, we can see this special care for non-adults and especially for very small children. Uh, so they could be uh, buried in a uh, rock cut shelters, jars, caves, or buried in a uh, house uh, floors. So some sort of special protection, like different ritual for them as they're very small and fragile. Uh, they often stay closer to the house or they have some sort of extra protection. And there is a huge prevalence of uh, neonate uh, burials with mothers or some other adults, but again, pointing to some sort of connection and, and special care uh, for, for small ones. With Bronze Age, as a structure of the society became much more like the, the, the complex, and uh, we start to have, of course, the use of, of metal. And we have sort of have this, uh, the, the societies that are very divided into their hierarchy. It also starts to be quite different, a um, lot of variety in, um, in burial rites. Uh, they are quite heterogeneous. So we can find these uh, mounds, uh, flat graves, cis graves, gallery graves, multiple graves, uh, secondary burials in caves. And um, cremations, of course, they started to be very commonly uh, in a Bronze Age. But what is also interesting is that we have cases, and not so little, of um, taking the, the parts of Neolithic, uh, some parts, especially heads, uh, from Neolithic burials and reburying those individuals, like the parts of those individuals in Bronze Age burials. So kind of 
uh, I don't know, proof of connection between ancestors or uh, new, uh, like those, those uh, individuals that were dying that moment and uh, need to connect or to have protection of ancestors. And uh, the, what is also interesting is that um, there is quite a few, not so much uh, of uh, children burials, especially children under three years. And it's sad that they're highly underrepresented in Bronze Age burials. It can be partly because it's quite, it start being quite common cremations. And we know that small children, they have such a small and fragile bones. Maybe they were simply not well preserved, uh, not good enough to to to, um, to be found nowadays in a, that amount, or it might be they were just having a special places for burials outside of Mount. And uh, Roman times, it's uh, in, uh, uh, starting from Iron Age, uh, they continue quite a lot with uh, burials. In a, with cremation as a dominant uh, type of burial. So it's um, until the, the third century AD when, uh, uh, the, when Christianity took over. The only exception to this uh, ritual would be like this, um, would be infants. So uh, the, the Pliny said that uh, infants who have not grown teeth, who were not allowed, always inhumated, uh, were always inhumated without cremations. And also some uh, personas non gratas would also be uh, inhumated instead of cremations, such as slaves or criminals. And uh, later with uh, this, um, uh, with acceptance of Christianity, uh, this uh, burials became more common. Uh, in our in our Roman times, like inhumation, and usually we would have some sort of blocks that would put like uh, vertically to limit limit to the graves. And uh, in Roman time, Roman period, the cemeteries were always outside of the city. A couple of quite a lot, uh, like this, this the distance was big, and uh, they were taking quite a lot of care that not to mix uh, those two things and. Uh, of course, that would be uh, worshipped, often visited. There were special celebrations, uh, but they already knew uh, that there was um, there is a possible problems, or hygienic problems, uh, with uh, with cemeteries. So they make sure that they are outside of limits of the cities. Uh, so we can have we have a lot of examples of uh, cremated. Uh, burials in the Roman times that can be really monumental, like enormous uh, constructions, and yet only very few uh, remains inside, like cremated remains. So it seems that it was not really important to pick up everything from the pyre, but rather just to have this symbolic uh, burial. And in some cases, the, the, the children, as we said, that they would usually not be cremated they would be uh, buried under a tile or uh, they would be they would use amphoras or some other ceramic uh, object that they would uh, just reutilize to to bury a, a child inside this was especially for very very small children and neonatus uh, with arriving of uh, christianism uh, this uh, as this religion doesn't permit cremations. So this uh, all the this Roman Empire that accepted eventually Christianity and surrounding countries, this custom of, of uh, cremations disappear until 19th century. I'm talking about Europe. Of course, in, a, in Asia, it stayed for very, for until now and still going, still existing. But uh, in Europe, this, um, it's, it disappeared until 19th century. So that was important that the body has to be buried in sacred ground, which means um, around the church in close proximity to the church. And it's also, it can be with or without coffins and usually without burial goods, um, except maybe some little personal belongings such as earrings, uh, rings, but no, uh, there are no anymore like this uh, burial goods, like intentionally put objects 
that will serve for, uh, for afterlife like it was in the past. So the common position of a body would be supine position on the back with stretched or crossed arms uh, and also had uh, the, the legs would be stretched and the head is looking toward these. This is important, although we'll see it's not always, always like that. But the idea is that uh, individuals should look at the, the rising sun. There shouldn't be some differences between adults and uh, child's burial. And uh, it's also that the, as everybody has to be buried in a holy land, uh, then for, for logically, for practical reason, at some certain point, uh, there would be no more space for, for new burials. So it, can, it became common to reopen the grave and put another individual inside and uh, do that several times. And eventually, uh, or you would have like completely mixed uh, remains like the one that we have on, a, on the image down, like there's so many reutilization, or there would be like necessity to build ossariums or some similar uh, construction where a lot of bones would be taken out and just put in some uh, order or maybe just pick up the skulls and uh, abandon the rest of, of those uh, individuals. So this is this kind of ulcerums or just um, or um, reductions that, that means that there was a certain moment they would make just a pile of bones in some corner of the church. These were also very, very common behaviors. In Muslim religion, uh, the, the, the person has to be um, buried only with a white shroud or some textile and uh, no any kind of uh, burial goods, not even personal objects. So the most modest um, burial possible. And then the corpse should be naked, wrapped in a clothes or shroud without coffin and uh, without any kind of jewelry, as I said. But what is really important and which can help us a lot to make differentiation between Christian burials and Muslim burials, especially in um, uh, parts of the uh, parts of the world where they're overlapping, like in a, in a Spain for many centuries, uh, as both of those religions are not allowing objects that would help us to, to know which, which one is which, this position is actually essential because in uh, Muslim religion, the body will be on the side and face would be turned uh, toward Mecca, no matter where in the world uh, the Muslim person is, uh, it it's always has to be in this direction. And so the, the burials are usually individuals, individually, but in some cases they might, they, there were cases also of mass burials or um, double burials. Children are normally uh, buried in the same manner as adults, but in some cases, uh, parts of cemetery would be reserved only for children, so we can find only uh, one place with, uh, with children remains. So uh, after we, what we've seen, uh, what is the, the proper way to, to bury an individual and what is the funeral practice in some of the uh, most important uh, historic prep, uh, periods in, uh, uh, in Europe, uh, we will now see this, uh, what is like this, um, the other side of it. So what is, what are deviant burials or burials that are not falling in these canons and why? So since a long time, the archaeologists and anthropologists uh, noticed and recognized that there are some individuals that are in some, for some reason, they are, uh, they're different, treated differently in a way of burial. Of course, we cannot really say how they were treated in their life, but we can see that the, the way they were buried was different. And uh, so, uh, and not in this high, um, high, uh, high ranking terms, like not different in like, oh, wow, he has so much jewelry with him, but the uh, uh, opposite, like, okay, this individual was really uh, buried in some weird way. So this special treatment for what we know from, uh, from archeological and also ethnological records, 
may include some uh, individuals that are not uh, not welcome, such as criminals, um, enemies, um, but also in some cultures, this special treatment would be uh, reserved for um, for uh, women who die in, uh, uh, during childbirth or unbaptized infants or even people with uh, disabilities. How can we record this, uh, this kind of burials in archaeological records? So we are focusing on location of the burial, like uh, where that concrete, that grave, is it like normal part of the of necropolis or it's somehow outside? Is there something strange about body position that is uh, different, that is not following the pattern that others are following? Is there some sort of like lack of grave goods or is there some unusual weird uh, weird ones with uh, buried with him or her? So all of this can lead us to some possible tracks that there's something different about this individual, something unusual. So in some cases, uh, the, the corpse can be simply un abundant. So this, this kind of bodies would be just treated as a simple waste. So this, um, this is reserved for some people who, for people who are for some reasons, are not considered uh, worthy to receive funeral ceremony. This can be uh, newborn children, poor newborn children, but they were in the past um, considered, in, depending of course of the culture, but they were not considered really to be a human, a person. So they had some weird uh, uh, status. And so their burials were like, okay, they, they didn't really care to bury them properly. Uh, slaves and enemies, as you can understand, uh, for some of prisoners of wars, uh, of war, outcasts, heretics, sacrificed individuals, all of them, in the, of, of, of course, again, depending on culture, but in many cases, they were not bothered to give them a proper funeral. So it would be just like um, they, can, they can be just deposed or the abandoned somewhere. And, this is quite common in a, in a battlefield, and we will, we will talk about that in future classes. Usually, people would collect uh, the, the side that win in a battle would collect uh, their own um, deceased while uh, their own dead, but while the others of the enemy side would be just left there without any care to to pick them up, or also in some cases. Uh, they would be, or they would have some kind of just thrown them on a, as a rubbish, or whatever. It's a similar, unfortunately, with with other uh, individuals like or extremely poor people and so on. For uh, from a medieval Christian perspective, uh, death is not the end; it's just the beginning of eternal life. So that's why in, uh, this, in the logical religious level, it is uh, the most important the, uh, part of Christian uh, Christianity and the, the objective or their culture is to be resurrected at, on the judgment day. So it is really important to, uh, there's a lot of rights that are strongly regulated in order to be buried in proper way uh, for Christians. And uh, in the past, it was extremely important that an individual recognized that the moment of death, like, okay, I'm, I think I'm going to die. And uh, then there is uh, the whole bunch of, um, of rituals that this individual should uh, perform in order to say goodbye, uh, to clear his or her thoughts, to, to talk with a priest, to announce uh, uh, his or her death. So this preparation for death, preparation for your ritual, it was extremely important, especially in, in the Middle Ages. So uh, it was important that, it, uh, that a person is prepared for that and that to announce that event. So it's becoming kind of public event for the community to share. And there is a really like this, uh, the whole literature uh, direction that is called Ars Moriendi or Art of Dying. 
that existed in 15th century where it's just <laughs> really a manual how to die properly. <laughs> and uh, what is the, the best advice is how to conduct uh, themselves to this uh, mortal moments, uh, last mortal moments on earth. So according to Christian religion, this would be a good death. So you know when you're going to die, the, you, you can feel it. There are some natural phenomenon that are telling you that the, your, uh, your end is coming close. You have time to, to confess uh, all the bad things you did in life. You ask for forgiveness. You talk with all the members of your family and then quietly and nicely you die of die age surrounded with uh, your lovely husband or wife or your children. And this would be like an ideal death in the uh, Middle Ages. And it was something uh, extremely important for them. However, everything that was opposite to that, that uh, everything that is unnatural or um, by, made some, somehow by uh, in aggressive way, in an accident, was considered bad death. And Similar, this the, that name exact in uh, in concrete is uh, coming from uh, from African ethnology, and for them as well, it's they uh, designate the, the every kind of death that is occur uh, that is not considered normal. So dying far away from home, uh, dying without your children next to you, dying in an accident or violently or infamous death, uh, dying during the childbirth all of that was uh, considered to be bad uh, death. And um, it's, uh, uh, and for some reasons, really like droning was considered really bad, really bad the way to die. And uh, because in this way, this the individual doesn't have proper grave and proper burial. So the spirit stay um, like, it's not calm, it's not, uh, it doesn't have its place, so it's day to continue wandering around. And uh, so, as we said, that uh, um, if the practice, funeral practice is habitual behavior, so all these examples of bad death are like this, uh, are opposite to that. that. So, this is a, uh, these are accidents or some uh, occasions that are not expected. And uh, they're 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 of course not very welcome in that. So in archaeological records, of course, we cannot know if the person who died uh, was surrounded with his or her children or not. If he or she had the time to talk with a priest or whoever the chief of the tribe, but we can see sign of violence and we can see sign of uh, violation of the uh, of habitual behavior in our funeral practice. One of very typical um, unusual or deviant uh, burial practice is a prone burial. Bur burial sorry, uh, so it's burial face down, and uh, it is linked to belief that the, the soul uh, is living can leave the body through the mouth through mouth. Uh, so burying the, the dead face down uh, was to prevent this impure soul for threatening the, the living. We also, we also know these examples of so-called vampires. Again, you have to put something in vampire's mouth, so like a rock or something similar, or to stick uh, a stick, <laughs> uh, but in another way to prevent uh, him or her to of going out and um, or cursing you. And, uh, but prone burial can be not only true in this um, magic reasons, uh, it can be also due to some, um, whatever is considered like immoral or socially unacceptable act. So this doesn't allow the person to be buried in as an equal member of this community. So it can be due to some like uh, unnatural sources such as like, but it can be due to you like, or being out, outcast of that community or being enemy simply. So this individual will not have the same burial as, um, as because it's uh, the way to, to show that you don't deserve respect. And if I don't want to just leave you in a wood, I would bury you face down. So in a way it can be, to protect uh, ourselves from the danger 
magical danger that this individual can uh, cause, but it's also like to, to shame that person and to show that uh, he or she is not the same as others. So as we said, it can be due to the simply belonging to another group as a case of enemies, but it can be due to some, uh, what is considered in that community immoral uh, behavior as far as criminals, murderers, uh, prostitutes, etc. We have some nice uh, examples here from uh, Bronze Age. And uh, it's, a, it's a site, uh, it's called Zero de las Cabezas in, uh, in Spain. And uh, okay, for you to get the, the idea of the situation, we have here the southern wall of the city. So the situation that we see here is outside of the city. And we have individual one, individual two, and some metallic objects around them, ceramics. Sorry, oh, I skipped too, too quickly. So one individual, two individual, and they, they are behind the wall. So this uh, situation was discovered like it's uh, very, uh, two individuals that are in quite unnatural positions, as you can see, that were buried or just behind the wall of the city. So this is not the place for uh, like normal based for burning. And you can see that their positions are quite unnatural. And um, also you can see that head of this individual is quite far away from the rest of his body. So the two male individuals were uh, uh, from the Bronze Age settlement and both uh, both individuals are born the signs of trauma, as we can see here in this femur. This is a femur, this is a tibia and a fibula. As you can see, nobody can keep that leg in this position naturally. So obviously uh, this, there was a, a cut, that, so the, the, the leg was partly cut. It. And um, not completely, of course, but enough for tendons and muscles to be cut and so it can uh, get into this weird position. Uh, individual B has, as I said, the skull well, like some 40 centimeters away, but the head is together with the mandible, which means that it was buried while the flash was still on. So no, no, there is no possibility that the that this was post mortem removal or uh, of any kind. Uh, and we can see that according to vertebras and ribs and all that, that this individual was buried in an anatomic position. So there was not posterior movement or anything like that. It was directly covered with sediment. And uh, those uh, two bodies were found in an anatomical position uh, and uh, uh, not any kind of articulation, even the most labial ones as the hands and feet were disturbed. So we can conclude that the time period between death and burial was very short and it was primary burial. They were not rearranged posteriorly in any way. And uh, to make the situation even weirder, we have around them some antlers that again, they're not, they were not placed there before or after this, they were placed simultaneously, as we can see, and as well as those two bodies. So we can see the foot of individual A is under the body of individual B, uh, which is telling us about the order which they, they were buried. You can see it here as well. And uh, uh, so you can see as well this, uh, the antlers here, they're just under the arm of individual B. In one case, they were under, they were over, sorry. And second case, they were un under. So uh, we can see that they were, some of them were put before, some of them were put on, uh, after, but definitely the, the their antlers were a uh, part of this uh, weird situation. So they were, they were actually that laid at the same time as the bodies, and they are actually representing some sort of grape goods. And uh, also shortly after they were placed, the body were uh, buried in the ground, and there was no coffin or sarcophax or any kind of, um, any kind of construction. How do we know that? Well, simply because 
there is no movement of any kind. If you have uh, free space, we will talk about that on, on other days on the course, but when you have a coffin, then you have free space. So normally the bones will move due to gravity, but if everything is stuck in a place, we can conclude that there was no, there was no any kind of construction. And as I mentioned that um, all the, all the vertebras are in a correct position, but the, the head uh, together with the first three cervicals is 40 centimeters away from the rest of the body, which is clearly uh, pointing to decapitation. Okay, so also if we pay attention to position of the of the body of this individual B, we can see that it's quite kind of twisted and uh, place it partly sideways, but the, this can be like a, either the corpse was dragged to the place where it was buried or it was just uh, thrown like uh, holding arms and uh, legs and just and then uh, buried. So, we know for four cases of decapitation during Iberian rule, and they've been reported uh, in Iberian Peninsula uh, so far. So they're, all of them were um, used as a trophies with a, a huge, uh, with a huge nail, uh, like put in their head, like with a hammer in their head. And uh, also another important thing is that uh, funeral ritual of Ebers is cremation. So the only cases when uh, individuals were not cremated were actually for some trophy purposes, such as those skulls. Uh, and it seems obviously that uh, those, uh, those uh, skulls with the nails or veg were stuck um, probably in front of houses or in front of villages uh, to keep enemies away and also to show like the, the, the uh, like uh, as any trophy like oh we are good warriors we are good in this so stay away and uh, so definitely this ritual this uh, sorry this uh this funeral act has some kind of ritual purposes and it's a uh, punishment and probably serve as a as a warning to enemy but so we have several elements here we have uh we have this uh funeral act that is different from the rest of the populations we have displacement of the body very chaotic like thrown away without any care um we have this pun additional punishment such as decapitation so like the replacing the, the body. And of course we have this uh, like we use, uh, inhumane, inhumation instead of cremation. So it's not official. Yeah, like we really don't like you. So you're not going to be buried in the same way as our populations, our community. So we, we will give you a completely different treatment and also your body should uh, serve as a warning to others who try to do the same, whatever it was. So what can, can we think of something similar, some similar examples in uh, recent history of like doing, changing the ritual? So of course, um, in this way, we have opposite, I mean, the same uh, fact, but opposite in Christianity where the dominant practice is uh, inhumation, you're using cremation as, uh, as a punishment, as a sort of punishment for burning the, the witches. And uh, in this way, it's like, okay, they're not going to even have a proper burial in, in the soil, in inhumations, they are going to be, their body has to be destroyed. So this is uh, very similar, just if the, you have something that is completely opposite of what is dominant practice in this population. So if this um, funeral practice can be defined as a habitual behavior uh, after someone dies, then deviant burial can be defined as a di completely different from normative. And uh, uh, so the, for so sociologists, sorry, uh, Goffman, Erwin Goffman, like stigmatized persons can be those who are disturbed uh, with disturbed identity, which means that they are not fully accepted by society. So 
they are not completely rejected, but they are treated differently. And this can be especially in the case of mental or infection diseases. So not only persons that are not belonging to, like that, that are from the other tribe or the other community or enemies, or um, in some way have some sort of unacceptable behavior will be, can be uh, buried in this, uh, in this way of like deviant burial, but it can also happen to individuals that without any of their guilt, let's say, that, that has some health issue or that during time got some disabilities or some other problems, well, they can also be uh, buried in completely different fashion and uh, showing again that they are somehow stigmatized so not completely accepted. So we will look at, at another example. This is from uh, medieval period in Spain. So this is, uh, the site is uh, called Santa Lucia. And we have two burials, right? One is, uh, uh, one is cutting the another, the, this one, cut it that one. And we have like normal pit in rectangular shape, the individual, well, we cannot say a lot about uh, the position of uh, arms, but we can see extended legs and a very similar way. And orientation is uh, east, west, looking at toward uh, east. So the same uh, burial as any Christian burial. And again, it's uh, the same as other individuals in this population. And then we have another burial that is cutting this one. And position is quite forced position. The, the individual is like, like with very flexed legs and very like uh, the, the position is very curved. And uh, also it's next to the wall, even cutting a little bit the uh, wall. So it's like the most marginalized position in this, uh, in this necropolis. Plus, it's cutting, uh, it's cutting another in uh, the, the burial of another individual. So, of course, we are interested in this guy more because uh, somehow he is an outcast in this story. So, it's a male individual that is uh, aged that is estimated between 25 and 30 years, like normal height, uh, very robust. But this is not something that uh, called our attention. There is a little uh, perimortem, post, uh, sorry, uh, anti-mortem uh, fracture on the head, but the fracture was healed. So that was not the, the reason of uh, the cause of death. So what was calling our attention actually were changes in, uh, in maxilla and uh, uh, there were like this um, lytic focus that is partly or completely destroying, also losing the front teeth, uh, complete uh, disappearing of nasal spine. It's a small uh, spine, spine here, as less spike uh, that is here in this area. And uh, all this is quite, um, quite common for leprosy, but in some other diseases as well. But then we have periostitis and lepromatous periostitis that is, can be seen in entire skeleton. Like these are this gray area and uh, the small spot that are on, uh, visible on the bone, like the, the layers of, of new bone. But what was calling the most, what is the most uh, significant was changes on the foot on the feet. So these are due to this, um, Affects as the peripheral nerves uh, are affected the, with the time, there's um, coming like this um, atrophy, uh, and slowly they're like the, the fingers are, and uh, on both hands, their feet are disappearing. So maybe you've seen, unfortunately, uh, leprosy still exists. So you could see this modern photography, but it's like people. First, it's happening this um, like contractions of the of the hands, so they cannot move them anymore, and uh, with loss loss of nerves and muscle activity can also be affected. And with the time, it's happening this uh, concentric atrophy, and it's even worse in a feet because once when a person loses the sensation uh, nerves, uh, nerve sensation in the feet. Uh, it can constantly hit the object 
So it can provoke um, a lot of additional injuries or infections and so on. And what is very important and what's calling a lot of uh, attention is that this uh, strange shape of, of uh, feet. And we can see this phalanges that are that has this typical uh, conical shape, and uh, so it's uh, leading to this com complete destruction. And we can see the same thing. This is not normal <laughs> uh, toe, as you can guess. So it's uh, definitely, we can say that uh, individual who's suffering from leprosy. And uh, we know from historical record that leprosy has always been considered a stigmatizing disease. And uh, patients who showed this obvious signs uh, uh, of diseases, they were often provoking rejection in society. And uh, those who, su who suffered from the, this Hansen disease or leprosy, they dis described this impact of social stigma that is far away worse than physical manifestation, despite being mildly, only mildly uh, contagious. So there are diseases that are way more contagious, more, way more dangerous than, than leprosy, and still they are not provoking so much rejection as leprosy. But leprosy was somehow since uh, biblical time uh, considered as a punishment for somebody's sin unlike other diseases that were usually considered as, um, as something like, uh, oh, especially in Christianity, like, oh, poor person, we have to help him. And somehow it's like um, leprosy was always seen like, oh, you deserve it. And um, so that's why we can see this uh, stigmatized treatment of this individual, even in a burial practice, even in a, in a grave. So. It's uh, always, not always, but in many cases, it would be the, the burial or outside of the grave or the most marginal uh, spot they could find. And also we can see that to hold this burial, it's, well, it's like the using the other person's uh, space, not even trying to, to make the, uh, the grave for, for him separately. Also like the position of the grave, very flex position like it seems that the individual was pushed there and also like the um, very quickly and just next to the wall. So without any care of making it uh, like decent or showing any respect to, to that body. And similar burial customs of uh, individuals with same conditions, although far, quite far away, of geographically were seen and also in other places such as in, in Croatia. And uh, can we think of some similar examples in more recent history about uh, infection diseases and, um, and this stigmatized? Well, if we just look at this image, maybe you will recognize this is in the very beginning of pandemic. When uh, in the then when uh, those one who died of COVID would be buried in this special kind of literary sarcophagus, and after that they they would be covered in cement. And so uh, nobody, no burial rite, no family present, uh, nothing like that. Bunch of strangers that had nothing to do in common except being uh, dying of the same disease on the same day. And uh, I'm sure that future archaeologists would be freaking out uh, with this kind of, of uh, cemeteries because this is not even proper cemetery, it's just the space outside of it. So again, we are, uh, it's not so different from uh, medieval ages and, uh, and um, they had like the, this stigmatizing of, of disease or infections. And uh, last, uh, before we finish, we will come back now to um, the theories, the Binford's theories, and how the status, rank, power, sex, and similar can be seen and uh, can be ascribed to, to funeral custom. So all of us have identities, like we have our social identity, and this identity is defined with many things. It's about our skin color, it's about our gender, it's about our ability or disability, our religion, 
our class in society, age, sexual orientation, and we can add some more. It can be immigration status if we are, if we just immigrated to some another country, we have different kind of uh, social uh, position than if we are if we were born there. Um, and of course, like it's not depending on those identities, our status will be completely different. So, uh, of course, a child will not have the same treatment as an old person. But unfortunately, of course, there would be a lot of uh, um, differences depending on a religion, or depending on sexual orientation, about the skin color, and similar. So. In idea, uh, as ideally, all these identities that are creating one person can be seen in a burial, um, in this burial practice. So, I, again, I have to say, ideally, this uh, there should be like the what we see in a grave should be a reflection of identity of that person, but as well as degree of acceptance within a group. One of the most typical things in, a, in archaeology, like an ideal situation, is that you have like this uh, grave of med medieval uh, horsemen. How do we know? Well, we have individual buried with horse equipment. So uh, we already have like, okay, we have material proof and we can say like what was the occupation of this individual and um, we can say like a position in that society and um, this is like very, very typical example. But we can also talk about the status from the other positions, like the, you remember from the beginning of the class, this very luxury grave in a Varna. So, okay, obviously we can see that this individual was, uh, has, has very high uh, rank in and a lot of power in uh, his or her society. And so the being forced had in 19 uh, stated that had the higher status an individual was, the more people would invest in their burial. Uh, we can think of the most easiest example pyramid. So one person died and hundreds has to put a lot of, lot of, lot of effort in order to, to build and many years and um, a lot of work just to build a grave for this, this uh, exceptional individual and like this important figurine. So I, of course, we will see now why it's not working for every cultures, but um, that would be the, be the base of the theory. And Tainer said that um, he used to create analysis of energy expanded, expanded uh, the energy that was invested in one burial whereby this more energy that was used in burials, the higher rank of this individual was. So the same like time investment and energy investment, but uh, for the idea is that the more important the, the person is, that more time or money or energy will be invested on his or her burial, which to, to a certain point can be seen in many, uh, many different societies, but of course we have to be very careful. Because a uh, critic says that special spatial relationship needs to be also determined as well as potential symbolic meaning of the, the burial. So uh, as we already mentioned that in a case of Christianity, you're not supposed to have any extra burial goods except in some. There are of course some exceptions, but you should not have anything luxury with you. But uh, so in this case, the, all the graves would be the same. They would be arranged in the same way uh, in a rows uh, with or without some kind of headstone. But when you look at it, you wouldn't see a lot of difference. But in this case, for example, the more important the person is that uh, the grave would be closer to, to a church or ideally if as close as possible to altar. So in this case, even if we open the grave of a king, maybe we won't find anything extra, um, not any object that is that can say like, okay, this guy is a king. But the, the position of this individual inside uh, will mean much
much more than any kind of, of uh, burial good that can be found. Similarly, now for uh, monks, mm, I used to uh, study a lot. Uh, that was my uh, my PhD was uh, nuns, and uh, of course uh, that led me to monks as well. But for example, the their monks burials can be the the, the simplest one you can imagine. But yet they might have extremely luxury life, and uh, we have a lot of proofs to that, uh, archaeological proof or history, even historical records about incredible uh, feast that some of them had, and uh, some of, in some cases, uh, their the 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 their like the the food they eat, the the access to like some luxury uh, stuff were like really amazing, and yet the grave will not tell anything about that. And that's when we're coming to um, bioarchaeology or analysis of skeleton, because without this, uh, well, this is what we really need to make the, the, uh, the, the complete image. So of course, everything is important. It's uh, like the place where the, the grave is, the architecture, the grave goods, position, but also the individual itself. So we have to include as well anthropological analysis or bioarchaeological analysis, whatever term you prefer. So this, uh, the health is extremely important because it's indicator of the status, because of course the, the higher the status is of one individual, uh, that individual will have lower, lower uh, least risk of infections, better access to medicine, um, differential access uh, to food, less hard work, and uh, also like this, um, we can also look at markers of occupational stress, fractures, cause of death, uh, if the person was uh, malnourished um, or not, if, they're, if he or she got the most of medical care that is possible in that moment. Diet, of course, like thanks to isotopes, we can get the, uh, we can see the diet rich uh, in animal proteins. Of course, it's uh, pointing to high rank of this individual, as well as uh, access to, to some luxury or exotic food stuff. Again, can tell us that this individual was coming from the from high society, but also the the levels of general stress. Uh, all this can uh, tell us a lot about. Uh, can give us the, the, the complete picture uh, and uh, that we can obtain through study of, of funeral practice. So only when we include all of this, we can get the, the entire uh, picture of, of uh, one person or one population through the, the history. Okay, that would be all. Thank you so much for, for joining. And um, for those one who had to left or couldn't, uh, couldn't be present, I uh, will upload the, the video so you can watch it anytime you like. And of course, if you're interested in this and uh, you want to join the course, you can still do that or any of our future courses and uh, follow us for more free lectures and uh, cool stories of Bonn. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Natasha. May I ask a question? Yes, of course. Thank you so much for this. Uh, I learned a lot and it was really fantastic. Thank um, you so much. I just put my video on. I just wondered about like a, a, an example of, uh, I don't know, Henry VIII, VIII uh, of England, mm -hmm. who was a king, but was also was very unhealthy. If, uh, if, we, if he only, I don't know his burial, but if he only had a single, a very simple burial, would we be able to see on his bones alone that he was a king or a very important person. Uh, he was not really favorite, I think. <laughs> That's why it was uh, not really proper burial and not very uh, nice life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but let's say, let's it's more like his, his uh, health, uh, if we looked at that and, and if we could, do you think that would be po possible in theory or? 
If well, we depending else. of, uh, we consider the, the uh, for example, we can get the information about his diet in childhood and mm. uh, access to some food stuff in a childhood, uh, which can give us, for example, information about if there was something uh, luxury on, on that, but just the exact position, if it's, uh, it's hard to say, of course, you can just say mm. that it was most, maybe extraordinary, but. Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Welcome. Well, thank you, thank you, really, everyone, for for this uh, for this nice um, feedbacks. Uh, it's really really nice to see that, and um, uh, yes, yeah, the recording will be available. I will put it. I will uh, put it on um, on YouTube. I will upload it to YouTube uh, tonight, and uh, yes, there will be. You can find the the future courses on uh, in AITA by archaeology, the, the website. And uh, yeah, you can see also like uh, Facebook and Instagram. So thank you so much for, do, for joining. Do, yes. May I ask again, do your yeah, courses, uh, what, what are like ECTS points or stuff like that for those? It's okay. uh, online courses are like this. Uh, there's like to to doing like depending on the topic, but between uh, eight, ten, twelve classes uh, with this. But we also have uh, we have also like a laboratory practice. So we have the part when we are actually giving you uh, homeworks and exercises, and uh, we also like working with uh, with the bones as much as we can through this format. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you really, everyone. It was really lovely. And thank you for a wonderful words. And see you soon next time.